Well, hello, my friends. How's it going? Happy New Year, and welcome to D&D Optimized, part of the D4 network. This is the show where each week we take a deep dive into one, sometimes two, specific character builds for Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition. We crunch numbers about them, we theorycraft about them, with the intent not to necessarily tell you the right way to play a certain character, or the best even, but really to just explore one potential way to build a character in the hopes of creating something that is both really fun to play, but also powerful in game. So if you enjoy creating characters for D&D almost as much as you enjoy playing the actual game itself, or if you're just looking for tips or ideas on a particular character that you'd like to build, then welcome home. This is where you belong, and I'm super happy to have you, so thanks for being here. My name's Colby, and I'll be your host. Really quick, before we jump into the build this week, I have some exciting news that I've been hinting at for the last couple of episodes. We have launched a merch store for the D4 network, and yeah, it's kind of awesome. Check out the link to the merch store in the video description. I'll post it there and try to put it, go back probably and put it on the video description of every past video. Again, we're keeping it fairly simple for now as far as designs go. We'll probably be adding some things as time goes on and energy allows. But you know, we've got lots of different shirt styles and even some hoodies and like beanies and stuff like that. So anyway, check it out. And as always, feel free to offer suggestions on more things that you might like to see. As for the build of this week. So I've done a thrown weapon build before. And it was a lot of fun because it was a bit of a challenge and I think it actually turned out really well. To date, that build, the Needler, if you haven't seen it, I think is still one of my favorites that I've done. So this week I wanted to try to do another thrown weapon build, but this time focus it on sustained damage per round as opposed to burst damage. The Needler was like a burst damage build. Wanted to find a way to try and build a cool thrown weapon character that focused on sustained DPR. In addition, I've had a ton of requests over the last several months to build a character that a lot of you are calling like the ultimate psionic character. Something that combines a couple of fun psionic themed subclasses. If I had to guess, I would probably say this is the most oft requested build that I have yet to do on the channel. And I get it. The concept of a character who has these fantastic mental abilities, right? Ways to protect or defend or enhance their own skills or even do psychic damage all with the power of their mind is really cool. And to have a lot of different things that you can do with your psionic powers makes it feel extra powerful and versatile. So for the character today, I want to actually combine both of these character concepts into a single build, a thrown weapon specialist focused on sustained DPR, who is also like a super psionic. As this then is going to be a little bit more of a character driven build than just a numbers driven one, I'm going to give myself two rules in the name of staying true to the character concept. Number one, my attacks can be made with thrown weapons only. This character, for whatever reason, is a thrown weapon specialist, and so the emphasis will be on trying to keep them in that lane. I'm not saying that you couldn't make melee attacks with those thrown weapons if you needed to, but I want that to be sort of the exception to the rule. Thrown weapons are fun. They're super stylish in like a gambit or like knife dancer kind of way. And there are of course big benefits to making attacks from ranged as opposed to melee. Most predominantly, it's easier to stay alive that way. And then rule number two, I have to get to both of the psionic subclasses I'm building for as soon as reasonably possible to both fit the character concept that I'm going for and to make this character fit that concept early in case you're playing a game that ends at relatively low character level. I don't want to wait until like level 12 or whatever to be my best psionic self. And so that's it. That's the end of the preamble. What's wrong with Colby? Did he get replaced by aliens at New Year's? Yeah, let's just let's jump into it. Episode 73, The Cyanife. 
And of course, as always, check out the fantastic art by my friend Randall Hampton. I love what he's done with this character. It's so cool, such a great look, and it really captures the vision and the look and feel that I had for this character, I think. So if you're interested in checking out Randall or following him, please look in the video description where I'll post links on how to do that. Thanks as always, Randall. And let's jump into the build. All right, at level one, we're gonna start off this character as a rogue. Um, and my plan for this character is to make a really good rogue. First off, of the two Psy-themed subclasses that we're going to be using, I think that the rogue is the one that scales the best, or at least the most consistently. But second off, while the damage that we're going to be doing here is going to be good, it's not going to be like best in class compared to some of the other sustained damage builds that I've done on this channel. And that's fine. We're here to take a character concept we like and that is fun and cool and then try to make the numbers as strong as we can while working within that concept, right? But because these constraints are going to limit us a little bit in just how far we can push those numbers, I think I'd like to then feel like I'm bringing something else to the table beyond just damage to help me feel like a really valuable and useful party member. And as I often say, every D&D party needs a good scout, right? Who can stealth, pick locks, find traps, etc. And few character classes do those things better than the rogue. So being a really good rogue is going to be a priority for me, for this character. As for the story, of this character. I'm actually going to be doing a fair bit of jumping back and forth from one class to another as we go along, so I think this would be one of those characters where I wouldn't necessarily feel like I needed to come up with a good story reason for multi-classing. Instead, I would see this as sort of like its own custom class that just happens to take some rogue levels here, some other levels there in different classes, and yeah, just call it your own custom class the psionic scout or the psionic agent or the psychic spy or the psy lock picker <laughs> i'm sorry that was terrible the way i imagine the story for this character is that they are a very highly trained scout spy maybe assassin even who has had intensive like infiltration and martial training perhaps from the Githyanki or elves, but who also has been made part of an experimental training program, maybe. Almost a like fantasy born identity kind of thing. Or like maybe something akin to the psionic training that you can put your soldiers through in the XCOM games. Has anybody else played those games? Fantastic games, if you haven't. Anyway, whether through training or some other means, perhaps you were born this way, you have begun to unlock strange and powerful abilities within yourself that allow you to do things with your mind that aren't really normal. So, as for our race, we're gonna go with the Mark of Finding Half-Orc. Close your mouth, it's hanging open, not a great look. Hey, you, get up off the floor, stop with the overreacting. I mean, it's not like I never do builds that aren't custom lineage or variant human. There's got to be at least like 20% of them out there that aren't, right? Maybe 25? I'll bet it's more than you think. So, okay, yes, there actually is a feat that I really, really want for this build. And I am very sad that I don't get to start with it. But I think the benefits from going Mark of Finding outweigh even the free feat. And that's kind of rare. Now, the Mark of Finding half-orc, or human, if you'd rather, they're mechanically the same, but the half-orc felt just a little cooler and more unique to me, comes from the Eberron book. I know that most of you can play with that content without any issue at your table, but if for some reason you can't or don't want to, my next highest recommendation I think here would actually be Kobold for pack tactics primarily, or yes, Variant Human for the free feed, but Mark of Finding half work. That's new, that's exciting. There are actually a few really nice features from this race that fit perfectly for this character. Um, first up, we get a plus two and a plus one for ability scores. Wow, that's so many stat bonuses. Feels like I'm being spoiled. And for those who don't know, I do always assume that we're okay to use the updated rules from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything that let us put those ability scores wherever we like. 
And then we also get the Hunter's Intuition feature, which lets us add a D4 to any perception or survival check that we make. The perception bonus is particularly nice for us as a rogue, I think, as perception is typically something that we heavily will rely on while scouting to find traps or hidden doors, etc. And our wisdom score isn't going to be fantastic, though you should definitely take proficiency in perception as one of your class or background proficiencies. Then we also get Finder's Magic, which lets us cast Hunter's Mark and Locate Object once per day, which will be an occasional nice little bump. For those who don't know, Hunter's Mark is a spell you cast as a bonus action on an enemy, and thereafter you can add a d6 to all weapon attacks you make against that enemy, and then you can transfer the mark as a bonus action to another enemy when that first one dies, um, so long as you you maintain concentration and then the locate object spell lets you locate an object <laughs> you name the object and if it's within a thousand feet you know the direction and honestly I can think of multiple times throughout various campaigns when having this would have been really nice so good utility but then we also as a mark of finding half work get spells of the mark and this is actually the main reason why I wanted to go with this race, even though we won't really be taking advantage of it until much later. With Spells of the Mark, if we have spellcasting or pact magic, then we can add some spells to the spell list of our spellcasting class. We don't have the spellcasting feature currently, so I'll get into this a little bit more later on when we do. As for our abilities, using the point by method, as always, I'm going to recommend that we start with a 14 dexterity and take our plus two there from our racial, a 15 intelligence and a plus one there, and then a 14 constitution and a 12 wisdom, primarily just to have better saving throws and perception checks, among other things. As for equipment, I'm gonna recommend that we go with the gold by method and that we pick up some studded leather, um, a few daggers, and thieves tools and your other necessities. It does seem a little odd to me that studded leather is never offered as a starting equipment option. It's, it's light armor just like leather, but it's a 12 AC instead of 11. And it's not particularly expensive. It's only 45 gold. So we might as well pick up that extra AC. Oh, now, why daggers, you may be thinking. So here's the deal. I've done builds focused on specific weapons in the past that are often thought of as suboptimal. The dart, that was the needler. Um, the whip, that was the whippoorwill build from a few months ago. I did a sling focused build. That was the swarm keeper ranger slingshot. The dagger is kind of a similarly sad weapon, only being a d4 of damage. And most of the time, depending on your build, you're probably going to be better off, numerically speaking anyway, with a different weapon. But there is one specific instance where the dagger is actually the best, nay only, weapon to use. It's when you're building a character who needs a weapon that is a melee weapon that has both the throne and finesse properties. The dagger is the only weapon that has all of the above. And I love to find ways to make an otherwise like suboptimal weapon the best one for a particular character build. Now, admittedly, we're not going to rely super heavily on the dagger for most of our career, but it will be an important part of what we do in the early game and then also later on. You'll see it'll all make sense eventually. So as a rogue at level one, we get Thieves Can't. Uh, it's the rogue's secret coded language that they can use to communicate with one another, basically. And then we also get expertise. Super important for a good rogue. You take two skills that you're proficient in or one skill and your thieves tools and then double your proficiency bonus for those. If it were me, I think I'd probably go with stealth and thieves tools. There's typically a really strong argument, I think, for going perception here. But I think with our nice little 1d4 bonus to perception checks that we get from Mark of Finding. I'd especially rather go with stealth and thieves tools. You do what you want to do. And then also as a rogue at level one, we get sneak attack, of course, that infamous rogue ability that lets us once per turn when we make an attack with either a finesse weapon or a ranged weapon, and we have advantage or we're making the attack against an enemy who's standing within five feet of one of our allies, we can add for now 1d6 damage and that scales with rogue levels. 
Important note, as I said, the dagger is not a ranged weapon, it's a melee weapon with the thrown property, and that's not the same thing. But yes, it does have the finesse property, so it qualifies for sneak attack. So for right now, this character at level one, you could dual wield daggers and either make melee attacks with them or throw them. The plus to hit and plus to damage is the same either way. You're not gonna be adding your ability score modifier on that bonus action attack. I think I'd be throwing them personally as it will help you stay safer. So just make sure you've got enough daggers on hand so you don't have to be running around picking them up every turn. At level two, rogues get cunning action. Um, as a bonus action, you can dash, disengage, or hide. And those things usually require your action. So that's really nice and it's gonna come in handy throughout your campaign. At level three, our sneak attack damage goes to a 2d6, and then we get a feature from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, Steady Aim. This lets us have advantage on our next attack this turn if we use our bonus action to take aim, basically. And we haven't moved yet, and then we don't get to move for the rest of the turn. That's a pretty steep price to pay for advantage on a single attack, I think. Obviously, there will be times when it will be worth using, but I really wish they would have just given you advantage on all attacks this turn or something if you decided to multi-class and pick up extra attack somewhere along the line. I think in that case, I'd probably end up making a lot more use of this feature personally, but anyway, it's there, available if you need it. And then, of course, we also get our roguish archetype our subclass. And we, as most of you have probably guessed by now, are going Soul Knife. Finally, I'm doing an actual damage focused build that uses this subclass and that is just oozing with awesome. I did use a Soul Knife build once before in my Skill Monkey character uh, a few months ago, but this is going to have a very different feel and purpose and I'm really excited to jump into it. So let's pause for a moment and read what my friends over at Describe came up with for this character concept. This half-orc is a majestic hybrid of violent threat and lithe grace. Every inch of their studded leather armor reveals the glint of a dagger, each easy to grasp and throw at a moment's notice. Their gaze roams around them, and though you see no visible casting, plants and refuse shift like they are being lifted or rifled through. As they search, they absentmindedly switch blades between spots on their armor, one from their forearm to their belt, one from their back to under their sleeve. Rearranging, preparing. It is so captivating that you almost miss the psionic blade that appears in their hand. Oh man, that is just so exactly how I envisioned this character sounding and feeling in my head, right? It's amazing. And okay, yes, let me talk for just a minute about Describe here. They are the sponsor for the video this week again. For those who don't know, Describe is a fantastic online tool that basically recreates the awesome, well-written, like, box text that you get in official D&D adventures, right? that describe a setting or sometimes an important character. If you've ever wished that you could have that quality of descriptive writing for your own homebrew campaigns, whether a setting or an NPC or even as a player for your own character or important weapon or even awesome spell or attack that you make, well, with Describe, you can. Anyone who wants to can sign up for a free account and get access to a huge portion of their library of thousands of scenes, characters, spells, items, actions, and more. But the best part about Describe, in my opinion, is that if you become a subscriber at the hero level, you can submit requests yourself for anything you want a professional writer to describe for you in-game. I just did that for the Knife build that I created today, and that's what I just read, right? That's what I got back from the Describe team. It's fantastic. And that team is filled with professional writers, some of whom used to actually work for Wizards of the Coast themselves. Describe is a great tool to use both while you are planning your session or your character, or to just sort of have open at your fingertips while you're playing or DMing. Maybe you assumed that your players were going to go to the ballroom while they're exploring the manor, but instead they decided to go check out the terrace gardens. You didn't really have anything prepared for the terrace gardens, but just a quick search in Describe will help you flesh out scenes and even characters that will make it feel and sound as though you had 
prepared. Or maybe as a player, you just got a killing blow on a big bad and your DM asks, how do you want to do this? Do a quick search and you'll likely find something awesome to really help everyone at the table visualize your coup de grace and feel more immersed in the world and the story that you're creating together. Describe is adding hundreds of items of content each and every month, so do yourself a favor, check them out if you haven't yet, sign up for a free account, and please consider a paid subscription if you like what you find there. When you go, be sure and use this link here um, so that they know you heard about them from me. That's really helpful. Again, it's describe.com slash d4. I will put the link in the video description, of course. But again, describe.com slash d4. And also, if you do decide to purchase a subscription, use the code d4 at checkout and you'll get 10% off. So thanks so much to everyone over at Describe. And let's get back to the build. All right, so the soul knife. Here's my hot take on the soul knife. If you're talking pure damage numbers, there isn't a lot that the soul knife brings to increase our damage in a big way. Outside of early levels. At early levels, sure, there is a nice damage bump as we'll get into, but long term, not really. That said, for my money, if you want to be the best rogue you can possibly be, the soul knife wins. It makes the roguiest rogue. And, and by that, I mean someone who is really great at all of the other things that, as a rogue, you want to be doing for your party. Scouting, stealthing, picking locks, disarming traps, etc. And, I mean, let's be honest, most rogue subclasses don't really add a lot to your damage anyway. I've complained about this multiple times now, I think, on the channel. I mean, especially not at lower levels. There are some exceptions, of course. You know, Arcane Trickster gets some spells that might help you add some damage. Critical hits from Assassin, if you get Surprise. Phantom Rogues can add Sneak Attack on a second target once in a while. And, of course, the Late Game Thief and Late Game Scout get some nice damage bumps. But most Rogue features for most Rogue subclasses pretty much add utility. And, again, for my money, the Soul Knife gives the biggest advantages to the things that most rogues really want to do well from a utility perspective. Let's discuss. So first off, we get psionic power as a soul knife. We get a number of psionic energy dice. We get double our proficiency bonus in dice per day. So that's four for now. But we can also regain one more as a bonus action once per short rest. So we can have at least five per day right now. Now we can use these dice to fuel various powers that we get as a soul knife. They are d6s, but they will increase later. And for now, we have two powers that we can use these dice on. Cybolstered Knack and Psychic Whispers. With Cybolstered Knack, if you fail an ability check with a skill or tool that you have proficiency with, like Thieves Tools, for example, you can roll one of your d6s and add it to the check. But you only spend the die if adding that d6 actually causes you to succeed. That is amazing, really. And you will probably want to use this almost every single time you fail a skill check, if you think adding a d6 might help you succeed. As for Psychic Whispers, it is the perfect rogue ability, letting you communicate with others telepathically. As an action, you choose up to your proficiency bonus in allies, you roll one of your d6s, and for that many hours, you can communicate with them telepathically so long as you stay within a mile of each other. And they speak a language. They don't even have to speak a common language with you. They just have to speak a language. That is amazing. And you can do it once per day for free without using one of your psionic energy dice. Fantastic, right? There's nothing better than being able to scout ahead stealthily and see what's going on and then be able to communicate back to your allies without risk of breaking stealth to sort of formulate a plan or coordinate when you're going to attack. Hopefully you can get surprised and then they come rushing in, all those kinds of things, right? Fantastic utility. But then also as a soul knife, we get the psychic blades ability. And here's the thing that is super awesome and kind of not awesome about this subclass, but we are going to commit to it 100% and we're going to make it as good as we can. So with Psychic Blades, whenever you take the attack action, you can manifest a shimmering blade of psychic energy and make attacks with it instead. It is a simple melee weapon with the finesse and throne properties. 
So sneak attack works, again, even though it's a melee weapon. It's got a 60 foot thrown range, which is better than the dagger without disadvantage, so that's nice. It, it actually has no like long range, so no, you can throw it further with disadvantage mechanic tied to it. It's just 60 feet. Now on a hit, it's going to deal 1d6 plus our dexterity modifier, so slightly better than the dagger in psychic damage, which is nice most of the time for the purpose of overcoming resistance to non-magical attacks. Though of course there are some monsters out there with resistance or even immunity to psychic damage, mostly constant constructs are going to be a problem. So just make sure you keep those regular daggers on hand for those scenarios. And then afterwards, you can make a second attack with a second psychic blade as a bonus action, provided your other hand is free to create it. So make sure you don't have anything else in that other hand. Now this bonus action second attack is only a d4, unfortunately, and that really annoys me. Would it have been so overpowered to just make them both d6s? Come on, wizards. Anyway, for now, this is a nice little damage increase for us. We get, instead of throwing two daggers, right, we get a bigger damage die on one of the attacks, and we get to add our ability score modifier to the second that we weren't able to add before. It's sort of like getting the two-weapon fighting style for free. And while the damage increase isn't bad, the coolness factor increase is through the roof. I mean, you're just summoning psychic blades and tossing them out like vroom, vroom. Oh no, sir, as you see, I am totally unarmed. So cool. Hey guys, coming to you from the editing room. Sorry about the audio quality, but I realized that while I kind of mentioned that the psychic blades was something really cool, but also kind of problematic, um, earlier on, I didn't talk too much about why it might be problematic. Yes, we kind of discussed a little bit about the psychic damage thing and the, how that could potentially cause problems, but I think the bigger issue that a lot of people have with psychic blades is that really in a nutshell, it can't benefit from sharpshooter and, and thus by comparison going, you know, crossbow expert sharpshooter is going to end up getting you more better sustained damage in the long run if you're looking to build a weapon using ranged character. Um, my response to that in a nutshell is essentially, yeah, that's kind of generally true if we're just talking numbers. It's not always true, it depends on what character level you are and if you've been able to pick up those feats yet, it depends on what the enemy armor class is, it depends on if you have a magic weapon or not and the monster's resistant to non-magic weapon attacks, etc, etc, etc. But sure, generally speaking, are you going to get more damage out of crossbow expert and sharpshooter for a weapon user? Yeah, most of the time particularly with the way that we end up building this character eventually. That said, we do, as I've said, get some nice benefits from, uh, from Psychic Blades, and more importantly, it's freaking awesome. And it's not just all about the numbers, people. Have I taught you nothing? <laughs> we'll find ways to make it still really strong so that we can have our cake of good damage numbers, but then eat it too of being true to the character concept and being really cool. At level four, we are going to take some fighter levels. And yep, it's just part of who we are, a highly trained Psy Knife. So as a fighter one, we get the second wind ability. It lets us once per short rest, as a bonus action, heal ourselves for a d10 plus our fighter levels. Self heals are always nice. And then we do get a fighting style as a fighter one as well. and. I feel like we kind of have to take the thrown weapon fighting style if we're making a thrown weapon specialist, right? Right. So from here on out, we add two damage to ranged attacks we make with a thrown weapon. Also, importantly, we can draw a weapon that has the thrown property as part of the attack that we make with it. At level five, we would be a fighter two and we get action surge. Once per short rest, you can take an additional action on your turn. We're not actually building this character for burst damage, right? But when you use this, it will give you some nice little burst, letting you throw yet another psychic blade on your turn, because yes, we're told that you can do that when you take the attack action. And that's what we would be and that's what we would be doing with action surge. So it doesn't let you add your sneak attack damage again on this turn. But now, once per short rest, instead of going we're going so cool. At level six, 
fighters get their subclass, their martial archetype, and we, as I'm sure you've guessed, are going with the Psy Warrior. So here's what we read about the Psy Warrior. Awake to the psionic power within, a Psy Warrior is a fighter who augments their physical might with Psy-infused weapon strikes, telekinetic lashes, and barriers of mental force. Many Githyanki train to become such warriors, as do some of the most disciplined High Elves. In the world of Eberron, many young Kalishtar dream of becoming Psy Warriors. As a Psy Warrior, you might have honed your psionic abilities through solo discipline, unlocked it under the tutelage of a master, or refined it at an academy dedicated to wielding the mind's power as both weapon and shield. Mm-hmm. Perfect. So, as a Psy Warrior, we get this amazing and unique ability called Psionic Power. Wait a second, didn't we already get... Yes, we did. And, in fact, this version of Psionic Power is very similar to that version of Psionic Power that we got as a Soul Knife. It's just that your Psionic Energy Dice fuel different powers. You're unlocking all the powers! And, no, just in case you were wondering, you can't pool the dice from your rogue levels and your fighter levels together to kind of use them on whichever power you want, as per a tweet from Jeremy Crawford. The fighter has dice, and the rogue has dice, and never the twain shall meet. You know, dice from one class can't be used to fuel powers from the other class. Still, we've got six dice now for each, and, and the fighter gets three powers that they can potentially use those dice on. Protective Field, which tells us that when we or an ally within 30 feet take damage, we can use our reaction to spend an energy die which reduces the damage taken by the number rolled plus our intelligence modifier. So that's 6.5 damage on average for now. It's sort of like the interception fighting style, but usable from range, which is really cool, quite powerful. Telekinetic Shield, so cool. We also get telekinetic movement, which lets us move a loose object, large or smaller, or a willing creature other than yourself. If it's within 30 feet of you, you can move it up to 30 feet, and it can be horizontal, vertical, or both. You can also just totally Luke Skywalker the crap out of lightsabers stuck in the snow. You are absolutely using the force here, and nobody can convince me otherwise. Oh, also, you can use this ability once per day for free without spending a die. So, before you go to bed, if you haven't done so yet, make sure you, like, show off for your friends, or maybe just yeet your Aelstein into the sink at the tavern or something. Finally, and most importantly for our numbers, we get the Psionic Strike power, which lets us add extra force damage to a weapon attack we make against an enemy within 30 feet once per turn. We spend an energy die to do so, and the damage is equal to the roll of the die plus our intelligence modifier, so again, 6.5 on average for now. And again, it's within 30 feet, so make sure that you're making the attack not from, you know, 60 feet, because that's the range of your psychic blades right now. All right, so here's a question. Can we consider this psionic strike part of our sustainable damage. I'm going to say yes, and this is why. I've always defined sustained damage for purposes of my number crunching with character builds that I do as something that we can expect to do for at least one entire combat encounter. Ideally, more often, of course, but that's the minimum requirement. And if I didn't do this, I wouldn't be able to include accurate numbers from, say, high-level spells if we're depending on spells for some of our damage, right? When we're using our highest-level spell slot, especially if it's like a 5th or 6th or 7th level spell slot, most of the time we maybe only have one of those per day. And so whether that's, you know, Shadow Blade, Animate Objects, Spirit Guardians, Spiritual Weapon, etc., 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 I have to be able to say, okay, you know, we only have one of these per day, but at least it's going to last us for an entire combat encounter. And while it's true that some combat encounters last longer than seven rounds, the vast majority at most tables is going to be fewer than seven rounds. And so, yeah, right now, we can potentially use this Psionic Strike ability at least seven times per day, as we start with six and we can regain one per short rest, that should be enough to get us through at least one combat encounter, if not more. Now, should you use it on every single turn until you're out of psionic energy dice? Of course not. It might be overkill, 
or you might need to conserve your resources, but you could potentially, and I like to explore the possible and then let you guys decide where and when to scale back, right? And so, speaking of number crunching, let's do our first damage report at level six. So right now, the tactics are fairly straightforward. On your turn, you just start going Now, what about Hunter's Mark? Should we include that in our numbers? We do get one use of it per day, thanks to Mark of Finding. <sighs> Fine. I'm hesitant to because you can only use it once per day, but I did just say that as long as we can do something for an entire combat round, I'd count it, so I can't very well ignore it now, can I? Hunter's Mark then, of course, is a little bit problematic because it requires a bonus action to cast and to transfer to another target after your initial target dies, meaning that if we're using our bonus action for that, then we're missing out on one of our with a psychic blade and that means it's probably only worth using Hunter's Mark if you're going to be making at least a couple of rounds worth of attacks against a target. But, okay, fine. Let's assume that you're fighting a big bad beefcake once per day, and so you take the time to cast Hunter's Mark first. You're going to be getting a d6 for your first Psychic Blade, a d4 for your second Psychic Blade, both of which get to add 3 for your Dexterity and two for thrown weapon fighting style, plus a d6 for hunter's mark. And then on your first attack that hits, you're going to add two d6 for sneak attack and one d6 plus three for psionic strike for a total of one d4 plus six d6 plus 13. And so against an enemy with a 10 armor class, you would on average do 34 damage per round. And against an enemy with a 15 armor class, you would do 27 damage per round on average. And you know what? That's not half bad. Compared to other sustained DPR builds that I've done, and as always, check the video description for links to spreadsheets and graphs that I keep comparing my builds to one another. Um, this build is fairly average. Middle of the pack compared to other tier two and tier three builds. Now, granted, we could only do this level of damage one encounter per day, and after that it would drop a bit, but man, we're gonna be a really great rogue already, and we have so many cool toys to play with, and have the potential to burst a little bit too when we need it, so I feel like the build is in a really good place. Now, some of you may be wondering why I didn't just push to Fighter 5 right at the beginning so that we could get extra attack as soon as possible. And here's the reason. For a character who is not planning on taking the two-weapon fighting style, because we're not going to need it thanks to the fact that Psychic Blades adds our ability score modifier to the damage anyway. And who is planning on making thrown melee weapon attacks. Going, say, Fighter 5 first, then Rogue levels would actually be about the same amount of damage as Rogue 3, Fighter 3. Going Fighter 5 would have given us one more attack per round, but all of them would have been with d4 weapons, right? Daggers. One of them wouldn't have added our dexterity modifier to the damage, and we would have had 1d6 less in sneak attack damage. Going the route we did, Rogue 3, Fighter 3, let us get to both of our cool psionic-themed subclasses as soon as possible, let us be a better rogue, which was important to me, and really didn't cost us any damage in the meantime. So we're really happy. But now that we've made it this far, yes, the best thing to do for us damage-wise will be to push on to extra attack. And so at level 7, we're going to be a fighter 4. And that means we get an ability score increase or feat. And I want to bump our dexterity. Naturally, that's a top priority both for our damage and our utility. And then at level 8, we would be a fighter 5, and we would then get extra attack. Now, one important thing to remember is that we can only use our psychic blades once for our action and then once as a bonus action, right? So even though we have extra attack, we can't be throwing two psychic blades with our attack because after the first time it vanishes and then we summon another one as a bonus action. So what do we do with that extra attack? Throw a dagger, of course. It's only a 1d4, but we do still get to add our dex modifier and plus two from the thrown weapon fighting style to it. Plus, it's another chance to land both our sneak attack damage and our psionic strike damage. So it is a significant boost to our average DPR. Just make sure that you carry a lot of daggers on you. And I actually really love the image that I have in my head of this character who's just got like daggers all over their body. Kind of like the describe description mentioned, you know, sheathed on like their arms, their chest, their back, their legs, maybe up their sleeves, etc. 
like a walking porcupine. Also, don't forget at fighter level five, our psionic energy die does go up to a D8 now from a D6. Um, again, only for our fighter psionic abilities. So that's a nice little bump for our psionic strike as well as our protective field. Now, at level nine, I don't think it's too much of a stretch to think that this character who has undergone some intensive, rigorous training both in body and mind, and who has learned to unlock some pretty intense magic-like powers with their mind, starts to realize that there are even more things that they can do with their mental prowess. So we're gonna take a couple levels of wizard here for a couple really good reasons, not least of which is the ability to cast spells. Because see, way back when we were first talking about race, you might recall that Mark of Finding Half Orcs get access to some additional spells if they have the spellcasting ability. We did not have that until now. And thus we get not only first level wizard spells, but we finally get to unlock those additional spells that have been lying dormant within us all along. Namely, Long Strider, which gives some additional move speed, and Fairy Fire, which is actually the main reason that I wanted to go Mark of Finding in the first place. Talk about playing the long game. See, the thing that would add probably the most to our sustained damage numbers at this point would be to have advantage on our attacks. We could get that once per turn with steady aim if we wanted to sacrifice our bonus action and movement for it, but not worth. We could have done a number of other things to try and get advantage, but this is the way that made the most sense to me, both from a character and also a mechanics perspective. So Fairy Fire lets you, as an action and with your concentration, force any creature in a 20-foot cube to make a dexterity save or be outlined in colored light, and then any attack against that creature is made with advantage. This is a really powerful first level spell if your party doesn't have a lot of ways to gain advantage otherwise. Now, I'll admit the cost of an action is fairly steep. That's a whole round that we're not making attacks, right? But keep in mind that doing this is going to grant advantage on potentially multiple enemies for your entire party throughout a combat. So overall, I think it's worth giving up an action, especially for a character like us who has action surge. So yes, you know, once per short rest, anyway, we could cast fairy fire and then action surge and start making our normal attacks now with advantage. And that's probably what I would do, I think, on this character most of the time when action surge was available. But another problem with fairy fire was that it's only available to a surprisingly limited number of spellcasters, bards, druids, artificers, and then a handful of subclasses. I knew on this character I was gonna to wanna to make intelligence my secondary stat, right? Both for character and mechanics purposes. Our psionic abilities benefit from a higher intelligence and also rogues are very often needing to make investigation checks. And so to avoid being super mad, a uh, multiple ability score dependent, I wanted to pick an intelligence-based caster to get fairy fire. Of course, artificer would have worked, but I think wizard works just a smidge better and i'll say why in a minute although artificer would work pretty well i mean you could potentially get the returning weapon infusion for our dagger attacks which would be nice and actually even make attacks with intelligence if you were willing to sacrifice three levels to get there but anyway knowing that i wanted to go wizard but fairy fire not being available to wizards is what encouraged me to then go the mark of finding route okay so if having advantage was so important why wait until level nine to get it good question admittedly if you wanted to start wizard i don't think it would be a terrible choice. That said, for me, for this character, being a really good rogue was really important. And so I didn't want to delay all of those roguish abilities and features. More than that though, I think this fairy fire tactic really needs two levels of wizard to work well. And taking two levels of wizard early on was going to mean delaying our sneak attack damage, our subclasses, our Psy Warrior features, and extra attack for yet another two levels beyond what we were already delaying them, and it just didn't actually make a lot of sense mechanically either. But now that we have all of those things in place, the time is right to make this move. Oh, and as for the other spells that you should take as a wizard at level one, I'm just gonna say pick your favorites. I'd focus on utility and out of combat things personally, especially rituals, I think. you know 
get yourself a familiar, of course. And then as a wizard one, we also get arcane recovery. It's a fantastic ability, letting us recover a spent spell slot once per day after a short rest. And so time for another damage report at level nine. And we've had some nice gains. We've got a bump to our dexterity, an extra attack, a little bump to our psionic strike, and now advantage on our attacks, assuming of course that our enemies fail their saving throw to fairy fire. And maybe consider grabbing silvery barbs in case a really important enemy makes their save against fairy fire? What was that sound? Did you guys hear that? Oh no, the anti-silvery barbs mob has found me. <laughs> and yes, I am making that assumption that they failed their save against fairy fire, even though of course it won't always be the case. Again, best case scenario. Oh, and don't forget, we're not using Hunter's Mark anymore since that requires concentration, as does Fairy Fire, and Fairy Fire will be better for us and actually our entire team, especially at middling enemy armor classes and above. And so, against an enemy with a 10 armor class, at this point we would be doing 43 damage per round on average, and against an enemy with a 16 armor class it would be 40 damage per round on average. So a nice bump, not a huge one, though we have gained some really nice utility increases as well. And don't discount the benefit that our entire party's damage now is going to receive thanks to Fairy Fire. But speaking of Fairy Fire, while I think it's a great spell, it's got one glaring weakness, and that is when you cast it, you don't get to choose who it may or may not affect. Meaning that if you have allies in the area, they might potentially suffer the same negative effect and grant enemies advantage when the enemies are attacking them. That's bad. Your solution, of course, would be to try to place the area effect of the spell in such a way that it doesn't hit your friends, of course. But the problem with that is that Sometimes combat can be a little messy, and you're often going to have friends and foes alike kind of all mixed and jumbled together on the battlefield, right? So if you cast Fairy Fire to avoid your friends, you will very often be leaving out potential enemies that you could have cast the spell on. If only there was a way that we could, like, sculpt a spell so that it didn't affect our friends. Oh, wait! That's right, so yeah, at level 10, we're gonna be a wizard too, and at level two, wizards get their arcane tradition, their subclass, and that means we get to be an evocation wizard because guess which spell is an evocation spell? That's right, fairy fire. And so yes, as an evocation wizard, we get the feature sculpt spells, which tells us that when you cast an evocation spell, you can choose a number of creatures equal to one plus the spell's level, so two for us, but honestly, this should be enough the vast majority of the time to not worry about your friends too much. Those friends will then automatically make their saving throw if they're in the area of effect. And take no damage on a successful save if we wanted to use, say, burning hands or something, right? So yeah, this is perfect for us and should let us get the maximum number of enemies in our fairy fire spell most of the time. Now, what if you don't really care that much about your friends getting hit by fairy fire? Maybe they have a super high deck save or, they're, or your team's loaded with paladins. Would there be any other subclass options instead of evocation? Absolutely. My two favorites for this build would be war magic or blade singing, of course, for the additional defensive and utility buffs that you'd get from either. But also, honestly, another big reason why I wanted to go two levels of wizard here was just for the extra spell slot once per day and was was a main reason why I didn't want to go artificer for this build because as a second level artificer you would still only have two first level spell slots once per day and you don't have arcane recovery either as a wizard now we have three spell slots and arcane recovery so we could basically cast fairy fire you know, four times per day, and that should get the vast majority of us through most, if not all, of our combat encounters per day, with sometimes even a spell slot left over for, like, a casting of Silvery Barbs. One other thing that I forgot to mention here, I did, my original plan was to try to find a way to work in the Aberrant Mind Sorcerer into this build so that I could have a trifecta of all of the, like, psionic characters, right, the psionic subclasses, into one glorious build, but you could do it, right, for this whole fairy fire thing. I mean, 
Sorcerers get the same number of spell slots. You could pick up with two levels of Font of Magic that would give you sorcery points, would give you another spell slot potentially in a day. If the Psionic Spells ability would have given me access to evocation spells and therefore Fairy Fire, I would have done it. But as is, the Aberrant Mind just didn't really bring much to this build, you know, that I couldn't get from Wizard plus the Sculpt Spells feature, which was really cool. Add to that that I would have been a lot more mad needing a high charisma score for Fairy Fire to work, and they're going to be making their saving throw against a DC based on my charisma. It just became a little too difficult to pull off. You could do it in the name of story if you just really wanted to be, you know, that aberrant mind so you could be just the most psionic character you could possibly be uh, in game, you know, go for it. I think mechanically speaking, we're just a lot better off with wizard. At level 11, we would be a rogue four. We're done multi-classing. We really need to get back to rogue levels now to just max out our sneak attack as well as, you know, pick up the other nice defensive and utility bonuses from rogue. So as a rogue four, we would get another ability score increase our feet. And I think bumping our decks here to cap it at 20 is a no brainer. It helps our damage. It helps all the other roguey things that we do. And then at level 12, we would be a fighter six. <laughs> Wait, did I say we were done with multi-classing? <laughs> just kidding. We're just gonna take one more itty bitty level in fighter here because there is an ability score increase or feat that we get at fighter six and I really want this feat and it's just right there. I don't wanna wait any longer. So yes, for the ability score increase or feat, here's a neat little thing that not everyone realizes. The dueling fighting style can work with thrown weapons. It's true. The only requirement for the dueling fighting style is that you be wielding a melee weapon in one hand with no other weapons in your other hand. And if you recall, we've very intentionally been leaving our other hand open so that we can summon another psychic blade, right? If you do this, you gain a plus two to damage with that weapon. There's nothing that says you can't throw that weapon, even though it's a melee weapon. Jeremy Crawford even tweeted about this too to confirm it. So. Guess what weapons are melee weapons with the finesse and thrown properties? Yep, our psychic blades and our daggers. So now we can with the first psychic blade, make sure your other hand is empty with the second psychic blade, and then still with empty hands with our dagger, and all three of those attacks get to add plus two from the thrown weapon fighting style and plus two from the dueling fighting style. It's a neat little trick that I really wish we could have gotten to sooner, but the truth is capping our dexterity is just better damage against all but the lowest enemy armor classes. Not to mention, of course, the other benefits that we get on this character, especially from having a high dexterity score. But at level 13, okay, we're going back to rogue levels and we're staying here until the end, I promise. As a rogue level five, we would get our sneak attack bumped to a 3d6. The rogue psionic energy die bumps here now to a d8. I really wish that our psychic blades would have seen a damage increase here, but they don't. So for now, that just means a bump to our psi bolstered knack and our psychic whispers. It's still cool and useful nonetheless. And then we also get uncanny dodge, a nice defensive feature that lets us use our reaction to have the damage against us from one attack so long as we can see the attacker. Staying alive is good. And so for our damage report at level 13, we've added to our sneak attack damage, we've capped our dexterity, and we've given each of our attacks an additional plus two to damage. And thus, against an enemy with a 10 armor class, we would on average do 56 DPR, and against an enemy with a 17 armor class, it would be 53 DPR. All right, we're still kind of middle of the pack, tier three, compared to other sustained damage builds, and that's fine. Um, we look and feel a hell of a lot cooler than those other sustained DPR builds. All right, at level 14, we would be a rogue six, and we get another round of expertise, which is fantastic. Assuming you took stealth and thieves tools last time, I'd probably go with perception and investigation here personally, but do what you will. At level 15, we would be a rogue seven, our sneak attack damage goes up to a 4d6, and then we get evasion. So now you get to laugh at all dexterity saving throw for half damage kind of things. Because if you fail that saving throw, which will very rarely happen, then you'll still only take half damage. And if you succeed, you'll take none. 
and you currently have a plus 10 to your dexterity saving throw. At level 16, we would be a rogue 8, and we get an ability score increase or feat. There are, as always, of course, lots of great options to choose from, but I think if it were me, I'd probably just want to bump my intelligence here more than anything, as it not only increases our damage just a teeny bit thanks to psionic strike, but more importantly, better ensures that our fairy fire is gonna stick to our targets, among other things. And then finally, for us, for this build, level 17, we'd be a rogue nine, and our sneak attack damage goes up to 5d6. And as a level nine soul knife, we get the soul blades ability. And this is both really fun and fairly potent. I really wanted to at least take this build to Rogue Nine, and I'm actually really kind of sad that it took us this long. I was sorely tempted to just rush Rogue Nine anyway, even though mechanically and numbers-wise it would have been worse for us. But basically this lets us unlock two more psionic powers that we can use our Rogue Psionic Dice for, of which we have 12 now, by the way, for both our fighter abilities and our Rogue abilities, so use them liberally. But these extra powers now are one psychic teleportation let's talk about this first because it's the most fun i think so as a bonus action you manifest one of your psychic blades and then you roll one of your energy dice and then you throw it 10 times the distance rolled and then can teleport to where the blade lands and that is just cool just bamfing all over the battlefield if you need to throw the blade teleport to the blade and then we also get homing strikes so if you make an attack roll with your psychic blades and you miss the target, you can roll a psionic energy die and add the roll to the chance to hit. And again, you only spend the die if this causes the attack to hit. This is pretty incredible and makes at least your psychic blades attacks almost never miss, especially if you have advantage on the target already. You probably wanna use this just about every time you miss with your psychic blades. To put this in perspective, with advantage against an 18 enemy armor class, you have a 91% chance to hit right now. Against a 20 AC, it's still 84%. And, and I mean, it's still even 58% against a 25 AC. So yeah, I'm just gonna assume that we can use this plus 1d8 now to hit on our two Psychic Blades attacks, because most likely you're gonna have them available when you need them, unless you have like Will Wheaton levels of dice rolling skills, or you're just fighting like Tiamats and Tarasks all the time. And so we come to our final damage report. We've picked up some great utility, defensive and damage features with bumps to our intelligence and our sneak attack, plus an extra 1d8 to hit with our psychic blades attacks most of the time. Thus, against an enemy with a 10 armor class, we would on average do 64 DPR, and against an enemy with an 18 armor class, it barely drops. It's a 63 DPR. So, okay, that's decent damage. Still kind of middle of the pack compared to other tier three builds. Not amazing, but not bad, and definitely a ton of fun to play. And so, final thoughts. If you average all the damage that this character does at all enemy armor classes, at all damage reports, they come up with a tier score of 45. That's a kind of middle of the pack tier 3, not surprisingly, just above the Bloodhunter Mutant and just below the ranged Bard Locker. So like I said at the beginning, the damage isn't best in class or anything, but keep in mind that we're comparing the numbers here to other builds that have been specifically made to emphasize sustained DPR. So it really is quite good still. Here's something that I'll also mention that I wasn't planning on talking about. One potential challenge with uh, the Soul Knife in particular is this sort of tying yourself to the Psychic Blades because there aren't a lot of ways to enhance the damage of what you're doing beyond what we've done with the thrown weapon and the dueling fighting styles, right? The big primary potential challenge is that the Psychic Blades don't benefit from magic weapons right? And yeah, that's kind of a bummer because magic weapons are a big part of most D&D campaigns. Now, the good news is you don't have to use psychic blades if you don't want to. You still could get magic daggers, for example, and throw them, right? If there's an artificer that in your party that wants to make you a returning weapon, you could use it and benefit from it. It does feel kind of bad to sort of have to choose between like an important class feature and 
a magic weapon. My hope, and actually assumption even, outside of like Adventure League tables, is that most DMs out there would probably, in lieu of giving you a magic weapon, let you get a little bump to your Psychic Blades attack. I would definitely talk with your DM about that as you're sort of creating and planning on playing this character in your campaign. But you know, even without using magic weapons on your Psychic Blades attacks anyways, they're not bad attacks. I mean, they are going to be magical. You do get some nice ways to increase your chance to hit with them, at least, once you get Rogue 9, which admittedly doesn't come until late. They are really cool, and, you know, we've found some nice ways to enhance the damage that they do. And again, once you get extra attack with the fighter, you're still going to be, at least once per turn, making attacks with potentially a magic weapon, even if you are still using your psychic blades. So it's not like we just can't use magic weapons or benefit from magic weapons if we go soul knife, right? But more important than the numbers for me with this character is that they are unquestionably one of the coolest characters that I've made to date. The, the fun factor is really, really high on the Psy knife. I mean, just think about all of the awesome things you can do with your psionic powers. Throw blades of psychic energy. Communicate telepathically with your allies. Throw up a telekinetic barrier to shield your friends from harm move objects or even players with your mind. And of course, maybe the biggest standout, honestly, for me is the way that we can use our psionic power to enhance our skill and tool checks, making this character, again, probably the best character I've done to date, excluding perhaps the skill monkey, at being a character that will almost never get noticed when they're stealthing, will never fail to find a hidden door or trap, and will basically always succeed at picking a lock, or disarming a trap. And that brings value to the party that you can't really quantify in a spreadsheet. So that's the build this week. I hope you guys enjoyed watching it as much as I enjoyed creating it. I love you all dearly. Thanks so much for all that you do to support the channel. Please do like and subscribe and consider joining if you haven't done so. But regardless, I hope you have a fantastic day. I hope to see you again really soon. And until then, take care. Really see truck door, that's so sad. Burninating the countryside, burninating the peasants. I did a sling focused build that was the um, uh, what was that? <laughs> burninating all the people and the thatch roof cottages. Did I say that right? I want to say that differently. Blah, blah, blah. Oh, that's not right. Bat roof cottages! Zoom, zoom. No. Whoom, whoom. Mm. Yeah.